Hi, um, my name is Dr. Neil Cox and uh, I work at the University of Reading and this is the third in my short series of short lectures on um, Frankenstein. And this one is going to connect up to another series of lectures that I did that you can find on this channel um, about the uncanny. If this is the first uh, talk lecture you've seen in the series about um, Frankenstein, go back to the beginning and, and see them in order, it will make a much much more sense. Thus far, you know, we've, we've looked at this very short bit from near the start of narration, where Wharton's writing to his sister um, about Frankenstein. And through thinking about this, I think we're starting to see that the text introduces what can be read as a number of oppositions, structuring oppositions. And it does that very gothic thing of introducing these structural oppositions to kind of go, you know, and to change them round. And quite quickly, um, those kind of, those certainties, um, those absolute differences, those things that make sense of the text and the world and the narrative become problematized. And we've seen, for example, um, that idea, I think, of, uh, of the opposition between the speech of the day and the writing of the night being worried. And then we saw that opposition between the creature in all its strange otherness. And Margaret, the sister and seeming recipient of the text. The white European woman and the other creature. Their opposition being questioned as well. And in such a way that actually the clear distinction between them and Wharton was not as apparent as it might seem. And I want to kind of think about this a little bit more um, by comparing two quotes. One, the one that we've looked at right from the start um, when Wharton writes his letter. Even now, as I commence my task, Wharton writes, his, that's Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein, his full-toned voice swells in my ears. His lustrous eyes dwell on me with all their melancholy sweetness. I see his thin hand raised in animation while the lineaments of his face are irradiated by the soul within. Compare that. You know, this, this um, enraptured description of this wondrous a very ill man, you know, um, by Wharton. Compare that to Victor Frankenstein's description of the creature he has created. How can I describe my emotions at the catastrophe or how delineate the wretch whom with such infinite pains and care I endeavoured to form? His limbs were in proportion and I'd selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, great God. His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of a pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes. They seemed almost the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. He held up the curtain of the bed, and his eyes, if eyes they were called, were fixed on me. His jaw opened, and he muttered some inarticulate sounds, while a grin wrinkled his cheeks. He might have spoken, but I did not hear. One hand was stretched out, seemingly to detain me. I took refuge in the courtyard, uh, listening attentively, etc. Oh no, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with animation could not be so hideous as that wretch. I had gazed on him while finished, he was ugly then, but when those muscles and joints were rendered capable of emotion, it became a thing such as even Dante 
could not have conceived. Well, look, in one sense, what we've got here is very much about oppositions, isn't it? Um, Victor Frankenstein, according to Walton, he's got these lineaments of his face that are irradiated with the soul within. The face has contours, it has lines, it has a distinct shape. And that shape um, is touched in some way by that which is internal, by the soul. The outside, the structure, is touched from something within that becomes visible in them. Compare that to, or how delineate the wretch with such infinite pains and cares I endeavour to form. That's the problem, you know, for Victor when he's writing about the creature, he can't offer a description of the structure, of the lines, of the contours of this thing, because it defies that kind of description. One can be delineated, the other one cannot be. Yet, even in setting up such an opposition, the one is sort of touched by the other, isn't it? Insofar as one is defined by its delineation and the other by the failure to delineate. Even in their opposition, they share something because they're turning on the same kind of words. They're kind of turning on similar ideas, positively or negatively, but they're spinning around the same thing. And you can see that, for example, also in the, while well, the liniments of his face are radiated by the soul within, compare that to his yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. In both texts, in both descriptions, both figures are about the inside making itself known. Now, for one, it's because the glorious soul within is irradiating out the, the linens of, of, of the face. And the other one is that you can actually see the horrible workings of the body, you know, poking through. But weirdly, there is something shared there. A notion that the surface does not cover that something is peeping out. And that means any simple opposition between flesh and spirit, for example, is problematized even as it's set up as an opposition because the one is touched by another. Yeah. Now, you can also see this even more extremely. We're now getting to a point where things are actually more similar than they are opposite. Look at the idea of, I see his thin hand raised in animation. You know, his thin hand is full of life, it's animated, that's wonderful, fantastic, I love it. Yeah. Now let's have the creature. Oh, no mortal could support the horror of that countenance. A mummy again endued with animation could make not so hideous as that wretch. You know, it's bad enough, you know, it's ugly enough as it is, but it's when... Those muscles and joints were rendered capable, capable of motion that it becomes something that, you know, even Dante can think about, you know, because it's so horrible. Animation is common to both, but wherein one animation is the very stuff of life, in the other it is a horror that is contrast against, you know, the stillness which should be death, that which should not be animated has become animated. And it doesn't mean that the horror of death has crossed over into the wonder of life. Instead, it means that death isn't keeping to its proper place. It's touched by its other. And even more extreme, you know, if you think about these two, the links between them. Both of them are, are constructed in terms of the lustrous. One has lustrous black hair, the other one lustrous eye. 
that same word comes in to describe both things. Wharton's fascination with Frankenstein on the brink of Frankenstein's death, that's when he finds it, is opposed to, yet caught up within the same language used by Victor Frankenstein on first seeing the monster which has just gained life. And actually this whole setup is is very, very strange. Because after all, the thing that defines the creature's horror, what makes it horrid, is contrast. It's because, you know, the creature worries that most central opposition between what is alive and what is dead. that it grants a kind of an uncanny effect. It's the contrast of it, the opposition of it. The fact that it, it isn't one thing, it's doubled, it's about a contrast. That's what makes it so disturbing. But then it's very difficult, isn't it, to set up a contrast between the soulful, wonderful victor who Wharton wants to hear, and the horrible creature who Frankenstein not only doesn't want to hear, he can't even be bothered or hasn't got the nerves to work out actually if the thing has spoken or even if he has heard it. One of them is all about the communication of the voice and the other one is about the failure of that completely. Yeah. These two are contrasted. But contrast is something that defines one side. You've got A and you've got B. Yeah? You've got Victor and you've got the creature. But the creature is horrible compared to Victor precisely because the creature is a thing of contrast. It's a thing that contains A's and B's. Yeah? It worries oppositions. And that means it's very difficult to set up an opposition between this and this if this is itself defined by oppositions. It's a peculiar, uncanny operation. The structural opposition is intrinsic to one part of that opposition. It means keeping things apart is a very difficult business. This idea of the uncanny, as I said, returns again and again to this text, as I hope I've indicated a little bit in these three talks. And just now we're thinking about these things Go back to that first video and watch it again. Think about that opposition between the listening of the day and the writing of the night. And then maybe have a look at the videos that I've done on the uncanny, the weird doubling effect of the uncanny. Because what I think we're reading here is an uncanny operation.